Well, I started, I couldn't wait to leave school. I left school when I was 14. Right. So um, that would have been in 1945. Yes. <clears throat> Let's see, when did the war end? That was 46, wasn't it? The war. 45, 46, yeah. So I, I would have left school um, a 12 month before the war ended. And um, uh, went s straight into to a, an apprenticeship, actually. But things were totally different then, you see, because um, I'd uh, qualified to go to the um, grammar school and what have you, but um, didn't want to. I couldn't wait to leave school and, yes. and start work, of course. Yes. That's so the way you think at that age, I suppose. So which school were you at? I was at the Frampton Cottrell um, Church of England School, which is now defunct. Right. <laughs> um, a little then, village school, you know, which was um, and then quite you good. Then you did an apprenticeship in Bristol. In Frampton Cottrell. Yeah. yeah. But you went to the Merchant Ventures College. I went to the Merchant Ventures. Um, that was um, a one day a week. Yes. Uh, I don't know how long I was going there, actually. I, the memory's fading a bit, you know. So that was craft skills, was it? Yes, yes. That, that, that was um, in conjunction with the apprenticeship, you know. Yes. Mm. And how did you come to start on your own then? Um, I think a lot of it was, I was always being told, oh, you'll be all right, your father will leave you this, leave you that, leave right. you something right. else. And um, you get so tired of hearing that sort of thing and I decided um, I wouldn't rely on that. I'd do something for myself, you yes, know. Yes. So the the first thing I started in, actually, was haulage, strangely enough. Yes. Um, built up a haulage business. It, at one time, I had uh, 15 vehicles on the road. So what age did you start that, then? I was uh, about... 17 when I first started. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so late 40s, early 50s, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, things were different then. I think it was probably much easier to start a business then because you had less red tape. And um, English lorries were very slow then, weren't they? Yes. Um, we had, uh, or I had then, several new lorries at the time, um, the top speed would have been 28 or 29 miles an hour. Mm, mm, <laughs> mm. Um, but they did the job. We, we used to cover the country with them, we used to take um, loads up, up, up as far as Scotland, but it must have been a, a deadly job for the drivers thinking back on it. And yet, you get all sorts of things happen. I know we had a couple of... Um, Fodens that were four wheel tippers. Now they were a better job, though, weren't they? A Foden? Yeah, they were, they were a very good vehicle, actually, and very economical. But again, as I say, flat out at uh, 28 or 9 miles an hour. But we had one driver that managed to turn one over on the, on the road just outside Tewkesbury. <laughs> Never worked out how he managed it because. Um, with a vehicle not doing more than 28 or 9 miles an hour, yes. it might have been, must have been quite a work of art to turn, tip it over. I think they was, I think some of the phones were supercharged and turbocharged, weren't they? they that was the later one. Oh, I yes. had some of them later. I had a couple of the um, eight-wheel Foden um, two-stroke diesels. Yes. They were supercharged. Yes. And um, performed quite well, but... Uh, you had to drive them in a totally different way to the way you'd drive one with a, the normal Gardner engine. Yes, yes. Uh, the gear change, for instance, with the, with the Gardner, you'd have to, to wait for the revs to drop before you could change gear. Yes. Whereas with the uh, Foden, with its um, supercharged engine, you had to drive it like a sports car. You had to whip through the gears as fast as you could. Right. Right, right. Totally different thing. And um, again, in a hill, 
if you started off in first gear, you, you stayed in first gear. Right, you, right. If you were going uphill, you had no chance of progressing beyond that until you were over the top, you know? Very little torque, but um, yeah, quite a nice vehicle to drive. But uh, so after the haulage business, you came to go into coach into coach building. Um, no, the coach building came first actually right. because of the ap apprenticeship. Um, I never actually went into the coach building uh, on my own. I um, yes. I was in the haulage. Um, had a couple of unfortunate accidents, including one in which a driver was killed. Oh, gosh. Um, that happened at, um, just outside Newport at Tredegar Park. Yes. Uh, never found out why. He hadn't been over his hours or anything yes, like yes. that, but just drove into um, one of the pillars by the gates in Tredegar Park and smashed the vehicle completely to bits. Yes. Um, one theory was that um, he went down to unload, he was carrying a load of empty oil drums at the time, and um, he got soaking wet on loading, yes. and uh, one theory was that he, he'd taken his um, trousers off to dry them by the heater in the, in the cab, yes. and somehow they got tangled around his legs, and, yeah, um, right. yes. but we, we never really found out the the vehicle was completely stripped it was nearly a new vehicle so was, you know there was no problem there but um so when did you get into paintwork when did i get into painting yes. uh, i don't know when i first started that um i first started by um spraying a few vehicles for myself and then um other people asked me to, to spray a few for them, and I, I almost drifted into it accidentally. Mm. And when it came to the Bristols again, that was accidental because um, I was out, it was on a Sunday. I was um, been out with my wife at the time um, just for a run on a Sunday afternoon, and a friend of mine, by the name of um, Bill Atterbury. He was um, a racehorse owner and he also owned a company known as Bailey's Caravans oh, at yes. Hambrook. Um, and in addition to that, he owned the, um, was it not the, the White Lawn or, anyway, it was a hotel in the, the Y Valley. Mm -hmm. So uh, we happened to be going through there, and I thought, well, I'll call in and um, see Bill. And we were there having a few drinks. And um, it's, it just came up during the um, course of having a few drinks that I'd been um, doing some spraying, you know. And Bill said, well, he said, don't talk to me about spraying. He said, I've been trying to do some of these Bristol cars hmm. and he said I just can't get them right for them he said doesn't matter what I do they keep sending them back you know something wrong with them he said I don't think anyone could please them well of course by this time we'd had a few drinks and and uh, I said well I don't see why not <laughs> I said um, if you do the job well enough, the, surely they'd be happy with that. So uh, the sort of thing struck up, oh, well, you couldn't do it. And <laughs> went on like this for a minute or two. So eventually I, I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, if you've got one there, I said, I'll come and finish it for you. And I said, if it passes, mm. you can pay me. And if not, you needn't pay me, mm. you know? And that's how I came to start doing Bristol cars. So uh, anyway, uh, I went along to his place at the uh, caravan works at Hambrook. And um, he had one there that was uh, two thirds done. So I, I finished that one off. 
and the people came down from Bristol uh, as they did and uh, inspected the car before they sent their transporter yep. down. And uh, much to Bill's surprise, they passed it and um, took it up there. So he had three there to be done at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, um, I did the, the next one and of course it was Bill's contract so he rang them to tell them it was ready hmm. and much to his surprise they said, uh, who did it? Was it the same fellow as last time? And hmm. They, hmm. he said, yeah. Oh, that's all right. They said, we'll send the transporter down and they didn't even send the inspector at that time. <laughs> Bill nearly fell off his chair, I think. So. Um, I'd started on the third one, and Mr. Lubsey came down, who was the uh, manager at Bristol's at that time. And still is. Mr. Mm -hmm. And he still is. Yeah, he still is. And um, he said, uh, could I leave that one and do another one for him? Mm. And I said, well, it's a little bit awkward, because I said, it's not, not my contract, it's Mr. Atterbury's mm -hmm. contract, you know. So anyway, the three of us had a talk together and it finished up that um, I agreed to, to rent the premises from Mr. Atterbury and mm -hmm. he agreed to hand the, the rights of the contract, if you like to call it that, over to me and um, that's how I came to start doing them and I, I just carried on from there. So how many did you do, do you think, all together? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Obviously, you had all sorts of I other know work at, the, to do. at the time they were making um, one and a half a week, and they had an awful job to sell the halves. Right, but <laughs> but um, I suppose I must have done I don't know seventy or eighty, right. possibly more. Right. right. Wh which model would that have been, or which year? Do you recall? Not exactly. It would have been uh, sort of nine eleven. Would it have been four eleven? Four four eleven. Yes. Yeah. Or um, early seventies. That would be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then they. Uh, I did a few different ones for them. I, I know they had a. Um, they had one they used it as a a trial car that they yeah. use themselves. Yeah, test bed sort of thing. Test, test, the test bed. Uh, that was a totally different shape. Was it? Uh, yeah. Mm. And um, I suppose they used to try different modifications out on it before they included it in the um, specification. Uh, yes. I did that one at one time. But it was mostly the, the one model. That, that was the... Uh, the biggest drawback I found with the job, actually, was the fact that, um, other than a change of colour, yes, there there was it, it could get quite monotonous, you know. Right, right. Doing the, the same thing all the time. Yes, yes. But it, it was a very good job all the same, and it was something you could you could take a bit of pride in, you know. And uh, they were they were pretty fussy, mind you, but. Um, there's no harm in that either, you know. So take us through the process. What what paints would you be using? Uh, that varied. Uh, some were finished in a, a true cellulose, and some were finished in uh, acrylic. Yes. Which is um, a different product, but um, up to the finishing coat, basically it, it didn't change very much. They used the um, Two pack. Well, they used a primer first of all because yeah. it was uh, aluminium, so mm. they used the uh, oxide primers. And then um, on top of that, they had the um, two pack uh, primer filler coats. Yes. And um, <clears throat> they specified how many coats they had to have, and uh, then you had the paste you'd put in to any, fill any. Um, blemishes, you know, in the in the panel bleaching. Yes. And uh, from there you, you progressed on to the finish. 
So you said they sent you, they always sent you up quite a bit of paste, quite a bit of filler. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you see, with a hand-built car, you, you couldn't avoid that. Yes. You know, it's, um, it's to be expected. But um, it's different to, to having a pressed panel where they all come out of a day That's exactly the same. The same. So uh, would they supply them to you in primer, or would they be raw uh, metal? Or? Raw metal. Right, right. Yeah. So you'd, you'd need to... Do the, the, the you need to primer you, use an you, etching primer yeah I the guess. first thing you put on is the etching primer yes. which keyed to the the aluminium yes and they were all aluminium bodies of course and you know and and new aluminium that's that's more that's very slippery isn't it is that more yeah, of a challenge well it wasn't um, so much like that because of course it had been uh, beaten and dressed and yes, yes. you know pulled into shape and they'd been um, doing all their panel beating on it, so it had been well worked by the time it right. it arrived. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so how many how many coats of primer would go on? And they'd have the one coat of the etching primer, yes. and then um, with the actual two pack, um, I had a. A different system for putting that on. I used to yeah. put, put that on with a, a pressure pot. Right. Uh, and that would put it on much thicker coats than uh, an ordinary spray gun. I mean, you'd be looking at about at least three times the, the thickness per coat. So, so pressure pot holds a vol uh, quite a volume of paint. Yeah. It, um, it, I, with I don't know how much it would hold now. It would be about um, two and a half Leasers, I should imagine. Right, and you wouldn't have a hand. You wouldn't have a, a, a pot on your handheld, your your spray gun. Yeah, you you with two. You'd have two lines coming yes. up to your gun yes. then. One from the pressure pot, mm. which would, by uh, the way the name indicates, it would have the 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 air pressure in the pot. Yes, pushing the material through, as well as the air in the normal way. Yes, but what vapor? Uh, yeah. Uh, what's the word? Atomizing it. Uh, yeah. Atomizing it. Yeah. At atomizing, it, yeah. it yeah. flooded it on, in effect. Right. Yeah. Right. So I mean, you you do the you do the roof of a car in two strokes like that. Right. Know? Wow. Wow. Yeah. But that'd have to be two very controlled strokes. Oh yeah. Otherwise, you'd get runs. Too, too much <laughs> material, or yeah, runs or yeah, streaks or yes. Uh, yeah. you, you know, it, it was something you had to get used to. Yes. But um, once you were used to it, you could really. Whack it on. Uh, whack it on there, you so, know. And would that, be, would that be for further primer coats or...? Sorry? You'd be using primer coats with the pressure pot? Y yeah. Yes. You wouldn't use it with the finish at all. No. Or, uh, no. You know, that, that was a, a much finer process, of course, you know. Right. So, the, so that, that was a process of putting quite a volume of paint, quite a, quite a thick paint Quite a thick paint volume on. of paint, yes. Um. And... Um, once that it, uh, once that it dried, you 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 had to give it ample time for drying. Yes. Um, once that it dried, uh, I used to put a mist coat on then, uh, just any 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 different colour. A different colour, but show just up, show just up a mist. Yes. To yes. show up the blemishes, and then and more it, more more rubbing down. Had things like the long bed sanders and that sort of thing, you right. know. And um, with these air driven, air driven sanders, air driven sanders, right, yeah. Right. And they'd be, they'd be how long? They'd be a oh, they, uh, they'd be about um, eighteen inches long. Right. So that yeah. that would that would let you get a flat finish over a over an area, a considerable area, rather yeah. than a patchy finish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so coming back to the rubbing down, you've, you've the, the etching prime has gone on. Does that require any 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 finishing? Any rubbing down? No. Um, you wouldn't rub the etching primer no. down at all. And then you'd the put the etching primer on, yep. and then straight away, as soon as that was dry, you'd put the primer filler on. Right, in, in considerable, uh, in considerable yeah. quantity. And then, as soon as that was dry, you you uh, put your etching, uh, sorry, your your mist, mist coat on. And that would show up the unevenness. That would show up the unevenness. Yes. Yeah. So that's uh, where a bit of the magic came in. Yeah, for spotting the, call it that, yeah. for spotting those. I'd, I'd call it hard work more right, so than yes. magic, but still. <laughs>
<laughs> so you'd then, be, you'd then be looking very hard at the surface of the paint, very closely. Yeah. And then you'd be working on it with a long bed sander, yeah. taking out the unevennesses. Yeah. And I guess that's what the Bristol Cars inspectors would be looking for, is it? The, the finish They'd be looking for any, any defects. Yes. Um, it, could, it could be variation in the colour. It, it, it could be where you'd uh, perhaps done a, a spot uh, repair somewhere, you know, in, yes, if you'd yes. marked it somehow and uh, not blended it in properly. Any defect at all. But obviously an unevenness at the primer stage would show on the top oh, coat. Oh, it would, yes. Yeah. Show through to the yeah. top coat. Because if you looked along once, mm. the, once the finish was there, yes, you know. So you've, um, you've, you've rubbed off a lot of the mist coat by now. Yeah. You've sanded, you've well, sanded you, that you, back. You'd rub it down until all the mist coat had gone, right, you see. Right, right, rub it, rub, uh, put it on, rub it all off again. As, as long as there was any mist coat left on there, you'd know there was a, a deficiency somewhere. Right, right. So once that was gone, you'd put the colour on. Now, they'd normally have about um, three to four coats of colour. Yes. And then um, sometimes they'd have a, a lacquer finish. Would this be would this be with a handheld gun or the, yeah. or the pressure pot? Just the hand the handheld gun handheld this time, gun, yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, and so three to four coats dried off, but cellulose cellulose dries off quite quickly, doesn't it? It in, does in between coats. Um, the only problem you'd have would be in very cold weather or something right. like that. You right. know, I didn't have a spray booth as it happened. Oh yes. Um, I did buy one at one time and never got round to, to assembling it, strangely enough. So, but, you, um, you did the, so you did the cars in, what, an open workshop? Just an open workshop, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. And um, uh, it was actually an old ex-army Nissan hut. Oh, yes. Yeah. So in, in the winter, it was very cold, and we used to have different means of heating. Yes. Um, mainly made up some stands with... Uh, the electric mm, heaters mm. on, put them around the car to keep it warm, you know. Uh, I think if Bristol's had seen the setup before I started, I'd probably never have got the contract. But wouldn't have, wouldn't uh, have got the job. No. Well, so the pri so the etching coat goes on, that dries fairly quickly, I think. Yes, it does actually. It, it's um, uh, sort of acid based right. thing, you know, that bites into the aluminium. Then the pri then the, the primers, the which are thick, dries quickly. Yes, yes. Actually, the the thing is, when you when you were putting that on with this pressure pot, you'd be walking around the car, you know, and as you, it would be a continual walk around process putting right. it on. So it'd be, be dry and by the time you got round the other side again. Yeah, and by the time you'd you'd finish walking around, you'd have to take your shoes off and cut the stuff off the bottom because. Uh, it was going on that thick that it would right. build up on the bottom of your shoes walking around the car. Right, right. Yeah. So that was a that was a real real body of paint. Yeah, real body of primer. Going I on. suppose in places it would probably be eighth of an inch thick or more. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yes. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. As I say, you'd have to um, you'd have to give it ample time to dry. Then we, we I used to reckon to give it a good best part of a day to, the, to yes, dry, you know, yes. make sure other, otherwise. Um, yes. And then the three or four, the three or four top coats. Yeah. And I suppose again, cellulose that dries off fairly quickly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actu actually, if it was a, a non um, lacquered finish, mm. they'd have, they'd have near six, six coats That's of colour, you know. <coughs> and is there is there rubbing down in between yeah. each, each coat? Oh yeah, yeah. Right. So um, not a hard rub down. No. Just what we used to call a, a D nib, you know, and um, with what 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 with like a thousand grade or very fine grade? Or? Um, normally about four to six hundred grade. Four to six hundred. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the final coat you rub down in twelve hundred. Yes. Yes. Um, another thing I used to do, of course. You learn little tricks, and one of them was that um, rubbing the the vehicles down built up a lot of static, right? You know, in, and and that would attract dust. any dust that it was in the right. air. Right, it would cling to it. Yes. Yeah. So um, 
the way out of that was to simply earth the car. Aha. Uh -huh. Get Trick of the get, trade. Yeah. Matt, have we got that down? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you'd, um, you'd just run a, an earth wire to, from the body of the car yes. to, to any point on the, on the floor, the wow. same way that you'd run an earth wow. wire in, in a house, you know? Because there's... And that, that would, take, are, that would uh, stop the static. There are electrostatic sprays, aren't there, that, that work on that principle? They, yeah. I, I did see that. Uh, I didn't have one. Yes. But Aston Martin used to use them, and I, there was some talk that I might do them at one time, but we couldn't agree on price. Ah. <laughs> but um, they used to use the um, electrostatic, and, and they found it very good for metallics. Uh, so of course, most of the bristles were metallic as well. But so um, Aston Martin, Aston Martin wouldn't pay a Bristol type price. No. <laughs> right, we'll, we'll, we can reflect on that. Yeah, and uh, the same went for Morgan, actually. I went up, went yes. up I met Peter Morgan and uh, looked over the Morgan works with him, which was quite fascinating because that was sort of going back to the coach building days, yes. the way they built their yes, bodies, yes, you know, yes. and I believe they still do. Yes. Um, they're a lovely um, car. Matter of fact, my second son is a bit of a fan of theirs, and he's had a couple of three-wheeled Morgans, oh. and uh, I don't think he's got one at the moment. He, the, the, he had one fairly recently, yes. and um, he, he was um, actually friendly with a chap. They used to go racing them together. Yes. Uh, I can't remember the, the, the other fellow's name. I don't think I ever met him, but... Uh, I know that uh, the second son, he was well into that. Mm. Right. So but again, I suppose I was a bit, a bit spoilt by the by doing the Bristols, you know, and my price was probably a bit too high for them. And can you uh, remember? Can you say what it was in those days? What the price? Can you remember? It was nearly going back then. It was nearly um, four hundred pounds a car. Yes, and yes. they supplied all the material. Right, right. Which right. was a very good job at the, at the time. Yes. So um, that's four to six coats of top coat rubbed down in between with four hundred or six hundred grade. Yeah. Final top coat rubbed down with twelve hundred grade, which is almost a, almost a polish, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then, and then some, some, and some would have some would have a lacquer finish. Yeah, uh, which I don't suppose you polish the lacquer, do you? You, um, you do. Oh, you do. You do. Yeah. And um, I, funny enough, I quite like the acrylic finish. A lot of people don't like it, but um, again, some people get on with one thing, some people get on with another, and there's no real, real. What are the What are the differences in the in acrylic? Um, simply the makeup acrylic. of the product. Yes. Uh, different, different base, different um, chemicals in the in the makeup. Yes. The two don't mix. No, <laughs> no. Uh, if you try and mix uh, those with acrylic, it goes like a lot of rope. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, so obviously different thinners, um, yeah. etc. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, I think it takes longer to dry. Um, no. Um, the biggest difference I found with it was that. Um, the acrylic had uh, almost a tendency to, to shrink as it, um, as it dried. dried. Yes. So it was almost like putting um, cling film on something and right. then watching it contract. Yes, yes, yes. That, that was the, the biggest difference. Uh, and it was um, also much harder, to, uh, much more difficult to, to blend anything in with acrylic. Is it a harder finished paint? What yes, it would be of the two. Yes, yes. Um, it would give you a harder surface. But apart from that, with cellulose, if you put um, a coat of cellulose on top of another coat, yes, they blend in together. They, they right. You, you, the one goes into the previous one. With acrylic, it doesn't. It sits on the top. Right. So you'd always tend to have that very fine 
ring edge, a r yes. edge yes. around the. Um, I mean, you couldn't feel it, but but you could if if you knew exactly where to look, you could see. Yes, and and as the paint ages, of course, it's sometimes more apparent. As yeah, well, as yeah. The repairs and so but, on. But um, you could blend it in by using a few tricks, you know, and. Yes. What sometimes people care. sometimes people go up to a if there's a a, 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 a a well a join obviously but if there's a bend in the panel or a, mm. an edge of a wing or something they That's take right. it up the edge and then the, yeah then the junction and, you, and you'd so simply have to spread it that much further yes each time yes. you know yes um, well a cellulose is more more accessible isn't it to the sort of um, perhaps if I say amateur restorer yeah for that for that reason I think yeah. Because um, the the process you've described, you can put you but can of put course, a patch on. I mean, to, to I'm repair. completely out of date now. Um, I mean, I, I would be lost to be honest with you if if I were to try and go back spraying now, because nowadays uh, the thing is water based paints. Yes, and yes. Um, I've had no experience with them at all. Well, having said that, the only experience I've had with them was um, not so much using them. But Ford's always used a, a water-based primer. Yes. And that, if you ever had to strip um, anything off of a, a Ford, it was a double of a job to get the primer off. Right. Other than sanding it off, it was virtually impossible. You could get the top coats off okay, but the primer, right. uh, none of the sort of orthodox paint strippers or anything like that would touch it at all because it was water based so it was a very right right so very right, so, tough so something that, that would attack an oil based solvent mm. wouldn't uh, wouldn't touch, wouldn't touch a water based yeah. one yes. you see but you um, you painted cars for Bristol's for the motor show yes some of the cars I painted were on show up there and um, I was fortunate enough to go up and do the bits of um, Touching up when they were on the stand, you know, just right. checking them over and that right. sort of thing. Right. Yeah. So the car yeah. would, and, and, and did that, that led to an interesting job for you, though. It did, with the uh, Monica. Right. Mm. And um, I, I didn't know anything about Monica's, but uh, they'd looked around the show and they um, liked the finish on the Bristol, um, best of all. And... Um, they sent their show cars down to me to be stripped and um, resprayed. And Monica was a French firm. Yeah. Made um, a, well, a wealthy French industrialist. That's right. A uh, very nice man, actually. Very nice man. Um, he um, had this factory there and tried to pick the best brains that were going in the motor industry at that time. He right. had um, English designers and what have you. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that I think the prototype was made in England, right? If I remember rightly. Right. Um, he got me to, f as I say, strip the cars they had on show and respray them, and then asked me to go over and um, see what their problems were. Yes. It was actually very simple. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd been over quite a few of the different manufacturers um, in this country, such as uh, the Morris plant at Cowley and the Vauxhall plant at mm. Newton and mm. things like that. Um, and the plant he had for, for manufacturing these monikers was better than, than anything they had. Right. It, it was just as if money was no object, which I, I don't think it was really. Uh, and um, he just said, look, I want the best of this, I want the best of that. Mm. And it, it was fantastic. I mean, the, the, with the spraying, for instance, the, the bodies were coming round on a, on a conveyor. Uh, they'd be sprayed and straight into an oven, mm. out the other side, rubbed down, straight into another oven to dry them. Yes. Sprayed again into another oven. Yes. I'd, 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 I can't remember how many ovens he had there, but it was a fantastic setup because he had this 
X Railway Shed. You know, they're yes. terrific banks, as you know, for getting the trains in. But uh, <coughs> he had it uh, sort of down one side and back up the other, uh, like a conveyor belt yes. Yes. for manufacturing these cars. And, and the bodies were on special jigs, so that as they went through, they could revolve and spray underneath them. And oh, it was amazing. So he was, he was set up for large-scale production. Oh, absolutely. Yes. But yes. I, I, they never did, apparently. And um, I don't know whether one of the problems was they had so many different nationalities working there together. Yes. Uh, and of course, it's, I suppose it's a natural thing that when something goes wrong, each one tried to blame the other. Yes. And, and you'd have quite heated discussions there. But of course, all in their own languages, so no one knew what anyone else was uh, complaining about. Sounds like a Tower of Babel. Yeah, absolutely. But um, as far as the painting of them went, the solution to their problem was very simple in the end. Yes. They were simply overcooking it. Right, right. Uh, that, that was what was happening. And, and you know what happens when, when it got too hot, you see, you, you get the, you know, the way a, a crater in a volcano bubbles, doesn't yes. it? With the, yes. You were yes. getting that effect in the paint. Right, right. So when you looked at it, you saw these li little... Blisters. Blisters. Yes. Uh, yes. And that's, that's what the problem was. So, John, um, you've told us about the... You uh, paint and finish the Bristol cars. Um, they'd have their final top coat on. Some would have a varnish coat. Uh, then the factory would take them back on the transporter yeah. for final assembly of... of um, uh, glass work and, and, and trim, And I the suppose. interior trim interior and everything trim. else. Because they'd have no, no interior trim at all when they came up, right. you know, right. no glass work at all. Obviously that might, that might involve some, you know, some scratches or yeah. so on. How, how would yeah. you handle that? How would that be dealt with? Well, um, normally they'd um, get me to, to go up and um, rectify any little scratches that mm. were there. Of course, they had all the equipment up there to, to do that sort of thing. Yes. They had more equipment than I had, to be honest. But <laughs> so what's the, what, 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 um, I suppose a deep, a deep scratch might go into the primer coat. Possibly. Into the rub down um, area. It, 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 very rare you get one that bad because, mm. um, of course, they were very careful yes. and uh, well used to handling them, you know. Yes, so yes. They, they, you wouldn't get a lot of damage at all, in effect, you just the minor, minor marks on them that you'd you'd go up and rectify because so they were they were very very fussy. I mean, they they go over a car with a magnifying glass looking right. for, looking for faults. You know, right? You, they had to be right. Well, I, I suppose with a car of that class, uh, they had to be. Yes, yes. But so you'd uh, simply you'd simply. Uh, a rub down a minor scratch with yeah. some, what, some fine wet and dry, and 600, and 800 grades, something like that. And then another touch it in again. And then a coat or a spray a coat or two on. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the varnish yeah. coat would that would you have to rub that off to to paint uh, through? Not it all of it. Not all of it. It would blend in. You see. Yes. With, um, again, that would be the difference between the solos and the acrylic. Right. The silos would blend in much easier. So you could put silos on top of a varnish coat. Yeah. It would. It would blend into marry it, into and then you put another then lacquer coat over right, the top. Right. Mm. Right. Because other, otherwise you'd have to clean off the yeah. varnish coat and then redo yeah. the process. That's right. And you didn't use a paint oven. No. Uh, so your 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 process was actually sounds quite accessible to the amateur re repainter. That's right. Yeah. I'm not, but uh, you actually put something extra in, didn't you? You, what, what was special about the way you did it? Um, I don't think there was anything uh, terribly special apart from the fact of taking a pride in what you were doing. Yes. And taking your time over doing it. You know? Yes. Yes. That was the, the main thing. Um, the biggest problem I had was 
getting anyone else, um, they would take the same sort of trouble. Yes. The, the, only, the only person I really found that um, would take the trouble, strangely enough, was my eldest son. Yes. He uh, was almost an, a natural at spraying. I don't know whether he'd been um, watching me or, or whether it was just um, a natural gift on his part or what. Yes. But, um, Within, uh, he was on his holidays from um, college, and um, within a week, he'd be perfectly capable of putting the finishing coat on something, you know. Right, right. But um, up to your standards too. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. But um, it was you. You just couldn't get people to, to take an interest in the job. They were simply um, interested in getting it out as quickly as they could, with yes. as little efforts as they could, you yes, know, and uh, yes, yes. It do that doesn't work. So, yeah. the, so the Bristols, you, you painted them yourself, really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You had to have your hand on them to, yeah. to pass um, the inspections. Anyone that you, you get in to help with it, you simply have to use in the preparation stages yes, as opposed to yes. the finishing stages, you know? So how many, how many hours of work are we talking about uh, for, for a 411, putting, uh, putting paint onto a 411, well, the process you've described? Um, it, would take over, <laughs> it would take over a week to finish yes. a car. Yes, the, what, what, one, one man. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, that that would be putting in fairly long hours as well. Yes, yes. Of course, I suppose with uh, with new vehicles, you weren't. Uh, it's quite different from a restoration, where of course there's there's coach work to be done. Yes, yeah. um, it was more satisfying doing the new ones. But um, uh, uh, prior to doing the the Bristols, um, of course, I used to do um, restoration on different cars. Yes. And the thing I used to find annoying was that you, you, you could follow a, a new car down the road and I suppose being in the trade, you, you tend to look at them and you, you could see the, even following another car, you could see, you could see the orange peel as we call it yes. in, in, in the car. And people would accept that quite happily with a new car. But yes. if they brought an old bagger in to be resprayed, they'd expect it to come out like a mirror, you know? Right. Right, right, funny sort of um, reaction there. But um, I remember I looked at a what was that I looked at? Uh, oh, it was a it was a Lotus, Lotus Talbot Lotus. They did a hatchback. Oh yeah, in the eighties, and I remember I looked at a new one, and yeah, I noticed the paint was starting to bubble around the wheel the wheel arches. Yeah, it was yeah. Still, still in the showroom, so that yeah. was very impressive. Yeah. Um, and a big name. I looked at um, I looked at a new Morgan, yeah, quite recently, and I thought, well, I'd call that orange peel finish. I don't know how they finish theirs now. I, I suppose they've updated it. Well, I mean, I'm I'm going back to um, when I was doing the bristles, which was back in the seventies. Yes, I knew that job was coming to an end because um, when Mister Crook took over. Uh, the decision was made to um, spray them at the factory. Yes. Um, there was some talk at the time of me going up there, but um, I didn't fancy working in a factory. I'd yes, always yes. been on my own. I didn't uh, go along with that idea too much. Yes. And um, uh, that's, that's how I come to be looking at other cars, such as the Morgan and things like that. Yes. As I say, they were, they were hand done at the time, but um, how they do them now, I, I don't know. Whether, what sort of uh, facilities they have for finishing them. So when was the so when was the last Bristol you did then? I couldn't honestly say. Um, I don't think I'd have the records even to look no. it up now. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, I've no doubt um, Mr. Dubsey could tell you. I, I dare say he can. <laughs> yeah. If you ask him. We, 
can ask him. Yeah. Um, he was very good, actually. Uh, as long as you, d as long as you did a good job, you know, he was very fair. Yeah. Um, but you had to do it. You had to do them right for him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, tell us about tell us about the episode with Volvos. That was where, um, again, when the bristles were coming to an end, I uh, went in to see Volvos and um, to see them about doing their warranty work. Yes. I was doing quite a bit of warranty work for different companies at the time. And Volvo said, oh, well, we've tried every spare in Bristol and we can't get it to, to match Volvo's standard. Right. So I said, uh, again, the same as I said to, to Bill Atterbury, actually, I said, well, look, when you've got something you need doing, send it out and I'll do it. And if you're happy with it, pay me. If not, don't pay me. Right. So... They rang me up and they had the bonnet from their manager's car, which was a sort of a metallic sea green colour. And he uh, dented the bonnet, so they were going to put a new bonnet on. They, they sent the new bonnet out in the colour. Mm -hmm. And I finished it off in the colour they wanted and sent it back in. And the following day, they were on the phone screaming, and they said, uh, what have you done to the bonnet? And I said, boy, what's wrong? They said, well, nothing's wrong, apart from the fact we've had to spend a, a whole day, and we've got another day to, to do, polishing the rest of the car to match the bonnet. <laughs> they said, what did you do? Did you pour it on or what? They said, uh, everyone gets dust in it, but they said, you've got no dust in it. Yes. And I didn't tell them it was just sprayed in an ordinary Nissan hut. Right. <laughs> I'd uh, done that the same way I used to do the Bristols. So what's your what's your no dust secret? Would you, were you using tack rags or or just the, because you, you wouldn't? I didn't use a lot of tack rags because they used to use, leave a deposit on the car. Yes. By the time you'd finished wiping off a car, you then had dust sticking to the tack that was left on the car. Right. Right. So the main secret was to use the earth wire and get rid of the static. That was the main thing. Right, right, right. And then just blow them off with, with a low air pressure, you know, not, not too high, yes, but yes. just enough to um, get rid of the dust just as you were about to put your coat on. Yes, yes. So that was the way that was done. I enjoyed doing them, really, as I say, it, the only th monotonous thing was, it was funny the way it worked out, but you'd, you'd very often get three or sometimes four come through the same colour even. Yes. And when you were doing the same thing continuously. Right. It was nice even just to get a break in the colour. But that, um, that, was quite tri that was quite trying, just the, the, monot the monotony of it. Yeah. Yes, you wouldn't... Uh, yeah. But... Uh, it, it's like everything else, you know. <clears throat> you enjoy a challenge yes. doing things. And once you've achieved the, um, or beaten the challenge, I mean, I suppose uh, most motorists, their ambition is to own a Rolls Royce. But then once you've owned one, uh, where do you go from there? That was next, yes, yes. You know, I, 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 um, I've had several myself, you know, in the course of my life. I've no desire to have another. Yes. The last one I had actually s s was while I was doing the Bristols, and um, it stood, in, stood outside the uh, place where I was doing the Bristols for a couple of months and didn't turn a wheel. Right, right. Do about 11 to the gallon. And yes. You get tired of them then quite quickly. <laughs> So there's all, you hear people talking about, oh, this one's got 16 coats and that one's got 18 coats and so on. But the process, the process you're describing isn't dozens and dozens of coats, but it's a great deliver No, you, you can give them too much. Yes, yes. And if you give them too much too quickly, you find the substrate is still soft. Yes. And then it can mark 
very easily. Right. You know, so you're you're better actually uh, giving them thinner coats. Yes. Other than the thinner, I mean the thinner. Yes. That, that's a different material. Uh, that, that's that dries in effect by a chemical process yes. being being a two pack. You know. Yes. It's a, it's a different thing. Uh, it wouldn't matter how thick you put that on. It would it would it would dry the whole way through. It sets like but, cement. But, yeah. Yes. But you see, if if you try to put silos on that thick, it, yeah. you you've seen it when you've if you've been using a, an ordinary tin of paint and you, and you waste some, yes. you get a film over the outside, but underneath that film it's still I mean, soft, still yes. soft, yes. you know. So um, it's a question of two thin coats are better than one thick one, you know. Yes, yes. Um, it sounds like you wouldn't leave your coats very long between between paint coats. Oh, and you would. Yes, you. You'd leave them long enough to to dry thoroughly, right? Otherwise, you would get that soft. But also, you can leave a, you can you can leave a car, a car too long in primer, can't you? In primer, yes. Um, or does it does it do they absorb, does it absorb water? I've, I've well, the, the two pack w wouldn't absorb anything actually. No. no. Um, as I say, that dries right the way through, and it goes off virtually like a cement, you know? Yes. So um, you, w you wouldn't have a, a problem there with water. Uh, even if you use water when you're rubbing it down, which you, you would on the final coat of, of that, um, it, because you do use all your long bed sanders and everything else to, to get it ready, yes. probably give it another coat of filler just yes. over the top of that, you know, yes. and then a fine rub down after that. Yes. Yes. And that would come out, uh, you could actually see a shine on the filler. It was that hard. Right. Once you drubbed it down. Right, right. Mm. Any other tips of the trade for the amateur, the amateur restorer? Well, <coughs> cleanliness is, is one of the biggest things actually. Yes, yes. And, um, Make sure you obviously you keep any oil or grease away from any uh, efforts you're making to yes, cause to, that's, to cause do that, it because that's lethal. Yeah, um, one of the problems you'd have with refinishing is some of the polishes that are used on them now. Um, some of the polishes when you when you rub it rubber vehicle down, the polish seems to go down through and remain on there, if you know what I mean. Right, right. Um, almost as if it floats down through the water. So you, you need to make sure that um, you use a, a good degreaser and a good, good uh, detergent to get rid of any polish that's on there, you know. Right, right, before, before starting. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. And if, if you show any, any um, try a small patch first. If you see any signs of, of the polish, you can usually see the, the polish effect in the paint. So if you see anything like that happening, yes. don't, don't carry on, yes, stop yes. and clean. give it a good clean down, you know. Get right off, get right off. Cleanliness is, is half the battle. Yes, yes. And, um, well, I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be allowed to use cellulose paints these days. Well, it's Did like everything else. Everything's changing, isn't it? And, yes. Uh, I, d I don't know how it's going to affect the refinishing trade, I'm sure. Um, I've long gone out of it now, I'm afraid. <laughs> Tell us about b using breathing apparatus. Was that necessary in those days? It should have been. Yes. I never did. Yes. Um, and I never felt comfortable. Now and again I'd simply wear the ordinary little face mask. Yes. But very rarely. Um, you were especially um, supposed to wear them using the two-pack fitter. Yes. Which could have been quite dangerous and it was... Is that isocyanates? That, yeah. Yes. And um, I should have used them. Uh, I've been lucky. It, it touched wood. It 
It hasn't shown any um, real ill effects up to now. Yes, yes. Um, but I wouldn't advise people to use any of those things without. You're, you're supposed to actually wear a, a filter with a hose on. Yes. And the hose is supposed to lead outside the spray booth. Now, right. how on earth you'd go around a vehicle wearing a, an outfit like that, I don't know. You need a very long hose. Yeah. Yes. But that's how, it, that's how you're supposed to yes. do it. Yes, yeah, so. um, I, I never did. Uh, as a matter of fact, after um, a day's spraying, you could step outside and it was just as if you'd been drinking all day, you know, the, yeah, as, as you hit the fresh air, yes. the, the fumes from the silos would affect you in the same way that drinking would. Right, you'd feel, you'd feel a bit um, intoxicated, yeah, yeah. a bit tipsy. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's quite, quite surprising. But um, yes, you, sh you should always, you should always wear a mask. Said he that never wore one. Yes. Well, thank you, John <laughs> Drew. Thank you very much indeed. Thank You're you so welcome. much for coming. Thank You're you. welcome.